Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to extend thanks to Anne and to Cathy also in terms of actually helping to set up um, the Fringe and also to Valerie and the team um, for actually hosting the residency um, that I'm involved with here at the School of Art. So, Angie Wyman. Hello, Canberra. And it's lovely to be here. And if we move on, I'm actually wearing lots of different hats in terms of this residency and my place here um, at Canberra. I'm currently on sabbatical leave from my academic role at the University of Cumbria where I'm a senior lecturer in textiles and I work full-time on a BA Honours Contemporary Applied Arts programme which um, combines textiles, ceramics and furniture. I'm visiting artists within the textile workshop here and I'm going to use that time to develop a new personal line of inquiry which incorporates my background of stitch and embroidery. And I've defined stitch and embroidery <coughs> as two separate components and I'll talk through that later in terms of how I use that particular terminology. I'm also the coordinator and the curator for the UK part of the NETS programme of which um, will feature further on in the slides. And last week I was a tutor at the Textile Fibre Forum in Geelong. <coughs> so I bring lots of different hats to this particular talk today. So firstly as a visiting artist I'm very concerned with actually looking at location informed practice. Um, there's a lot of references to that notion of actually being an artist in residence, whereas in theory you're actually out of residence. I'm a long way away from home and I'm settling in. So it really is looking at how you actually use a residency to actually reflect upon your current practice and your known ways of working, your established practices, your identity as a maker, but then actually using that period of time to actually bring about new ways of working and actually challenge existing notions and practices. So that's really um, how it's going to develop and really looking at using initial sampling as sketchbook pages and drawing with stitch. So my practice is embroidery and embroidery is a term, how do you define it? It, I probably spend a lot longer telling people what it isn't to, as to telling people what it is. It comes with a lot of preconceived ideas in terms of how embroidery is and how it sits within the realm of craft and within fine art practice. I work with felt, I work with quilting, hand and machine embroidery. And I create textile pieces which are assembled using mixed media and they're using stitch to actually attach components to a substrate of fabric. And I found very early on that I need to personalise and to create the surface that I work on. That's a very important aspect, that I make the surface that I then embellish, which is where the embroidery. The stitch becomes the construction of the substrate and the embroidery becomes the embellishment and the decoration. So I use that making time to make and to respond, to think and to draw. And it really is the sewing machine, when you free machine embroidery, it's a drawing tool and it provides you with a visual language that is very um, precise, it is very rigid and it can be contrasted with the hand stitch and hand embroidery. These are pieces that I like sketchbook pages, they're assembled from offcuts of fabric, from parts of garments that are deconstructed and reconstructed, and then using elements from our own textile language, um, using buttons, press studs, fasteners, and actually building up different pattern qualities and compositions from them. So following from that, I found this particular quote that came from tapestry artist but it applies to making and it's a paper written by Jane Kidd from the Alberta College of Art and Design and 
Her quote was, like all textiles, a tapestry transpires as a form of woven speech, spoken through the skill of the maker's hands. The result of knowing hands shaping a sequence of thoughts through actions, and I know we have had this conversation with Valerie, we were talking about this, the idea that the making process happens through the doing that you actually are building upon that visual language and you're actually drawing upon the experience that you have that is hardwired in you, that is built upon through years of practice. I've set up a haberdasher blog at WordPress which will document my time while I'm here and the work that I'm doing. I can give you that address. Um, I've called it the haberdasher because that's what I do. I collect haberdashery and then use the haberdashery to create and build from. And I do quite a bit of dashing about as well at the same time. This piece is a detail from a quilt which was produced using cyanotype, which is a chemical that reacts to light. And the objects, it's called puntuenaria, which is the Italian phrase for lace. And the lace objects are placed onto the fabric, which is sensitized with the chemical and then exposed to light. So it works in a very similar process to a photogram, which was then used to build up the imagery and to then develop the embroidery onto that surface. This piece, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realise it was going to project as such a pale slide. Um, that piece, again, in the palm of your hand, is built up from separate components. It's built up from um, gloves, lace, collars, different fabrics that are then used to actually start to build up the composition for the quilt. And I've included pins, um, buckles. There's a number of different objects that are included and built into that. I'm sorry it's, it's came through as such a pale image. This was a series of pieces that were built and created for an exhibition about Alice in Wonderland and I made a series <coughs> of tea cozies that used very simple canther stitching, which is a, a running stitch um, to build up the tea cosies based upon the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. This is a detail from one of my quilts, which uses a habitat surface and then combines a series of stitched and machine stitched and hand stitched marks and fragments from other other clothing other parts of clothing so the little square that you have on the top right is just a fragment that I found um, in an old jumble bag a button box um, we had lots of talks while we were at textile forum about the the value of the button box in the home and how everybody has a button box that they sort through and use and it becomes part of, of the family. So these are actually using them to start to create the compositions. And again here, working with Habitai, working with Organza and actually using a sheer top surface to the quilt so that you actually see through to the wadding because that important thing that the quilt is it's, it's seen as something that is a protective component it has a method of it keeps you warm, it protects you um, but if you can actually see through and see through to what is hidden underneath the quilt it allows you to actually trap and embed different articles into that This was a small piece that was shown as part of the NETS project um, that was on show in Geelong last week. And I'm actually using bags and pockets to reference the concept of the NETS, but actually trapping buttons, lace, and fragments of textiles underneath the sheer surface. Again here, 
using the components that you have on hand to actually start to develop the composition. So a dozen buttons then starts to get arranged into some sort of formal language that you can then develop through into the bag format. And also working with the sheer fabrics as well because they allow you to look through, they allow you to see through. It's the idea of the containers of history. So moving on then, we move to the next project and our connection with the Australian Nets group began back <coughs> in 2008 and it started with an email conversation with Nancy Tingey who's in the audience and our Nets group was developed from our alumni at the university and it consists of staff and BA honours and MA graduates. We're all practitioners. I use this quote from Leslie Miller who is a curator in the UK and she's recently curated a large international project called Cultex which connected groups of makers from different countries and that idea of interconnected networks of energies and exchanges provide opportunities to challenge traditional <coughs> beliefs concerning <coughs> cultural particularity and difference and I think that's what we've found that you know the, the, the groups they have their own identity and they've developed their own identity through the people that have actually participated within them but again through that it has allowed us to share our cultural differences according to the way that we responded to the actual next theme So we connected in many ways. We connected through a networks blog which was set up from Australia and through colleagues who studied together for PhD. That brought about our Finland and UK and Australia connections. Through our alumni, through websites and also through group exhibitions that we held. So a number of different sources that brought us together. So there you go, Nancy. I've tracked it back. It's the first email that came, took us back to 2008. So it began as most creative projects begin, as a conversation, albeit through email. And we began by sharing ideas and thoughts and discussing how to maintain contact. We learnt to blog and well some of us learnt to blog, a few of you already knew how to do it and just the communication between different time zones. <coughs> that was our initial exhibiting group and it's changed and people have contributed, people have opted out but generally it stays within that format of makers. now go on to actually look at some of the works. Some of these were shown at the first NETS exhibition back in 2010 and some of them have, are still practicing and showed with us last week at Geelong. So Jill Ferguson's working with Nuno felt and laminated plastic to create a butterfly net. So it uses the idea of the silk that comes from the moth that then traps. We have Avril who's working with communication and using embroidery to create these lines and chains of thought. And in our original show they were exhibited between typewriters. So it was about chattering, communicating and that looping of information. And these are free machine embroidered on Solvi, which is a dissolvable fabric. And that is then dissolved away to reveal the fabric and the stitch. And these are then joined together. So each one is a separate A4 component. So there's probably about 50 in each line. 
Julia Tristan, if I can just move to the next slide, that gives you an idea of the work that she was creating. She's worked with bra dresses and she has created <coughs> garments that use donated bras. And she put out a nationwide call for them and she got quite a few celebrity ones donated as well. And she's made garments from <coughs> these. And a couple of years ago we had on in Trafalgar Square in London, Anthony Gormley did something called the Fourth Plinth, where you could send in a request to actually stand on it and discuss your particular project and she was selected for that so she wore one of the bra ra dresses and stood up on the fourth plinth. Um, so from that idea of actually using something that is very intimate that nobody very often sees that or discards and then actually using those to make a new series of garments. So the two, the two outfits on the right hand side um, were shown as part of the NET exhibition. So she's building new costumes from deconstructed textiles and garments and household textiles <coughs> as well. So if you just look back, that was some of the other pieces that she worked with. So you can see how she's deconstructing the, um, the loops, the fastenings, to make the new forms. One of the things we did have with our next show was actually have um, a collaboration. So we had two sisters working together, and this is the piece. This is Alison Murphy and Fiona Lynn. Alison works with ceramics and stitch and created the large sphere on the bottom left, and then Fiona created the corresponding cones that worked alongside that. Later on, I'll show you... Um, a DVD from Stella and she worked with combinations of weave, hand weave, devore and lace making and combined that with animation. So what you have is you have stop motion animation that is shown alongside the textile pieces. Have examples of indigo have rug tufting so that is used as a drawing tool to actually create carpets so that becomes part of of the work of the network and Angela as a milliner she was based in London throughout the net project and she actually held a catwalk show through London so she worked with a photographer and actually held a catwalk event as part of the project Raymond Honeyman is a printed textiles tutor who worked with us for a number of years. He designs for Liberty and he designs for Ermine Tapestries who are based in the UK. So he works, he's a printed textile designer, but he works with stitch design for Needlepoint. And finally, going back to the caps, I think I found the perfect hat, which is Maggie Tona Edgar's thinking cap. And she worked with hairpin crochet to create this. And as a result of the NET project, she published a book. Okay, so I'll let you have a look through that. It's available as an e-book and also as a um, paperback book via Amazon. But it really it looks at reflective practice. It looks at how makers actually respond through the creative process and document that. So she's using things like mind maps and actually creating those into textile substrates and surfaces. Okay. These are some shots of the gallery, the format, so you just get a feel for the way the work was displayed. Just to put some context. We worked with sixth form students. They did a critique of the show which was all good fun. We took it on tour, so we went to the Knitting and Stitching Show at Harrogate and to the NEC in Birmingham. So it gave us that chance to regroup and reselect 
and to build on the original exhibition. It was featured in the media through Craft and Design magazine, which is a major national UK publication, through UK exhibitions, and through back in Australia through Textile Fibre Forum, through Janet DeBurr's support. And then we moved to Finland in 2009. And again in 2011, where we worked with the group, and you'll see Valerie and Ali de Groot and Nancy Tingey. <coughs> that was the end of the basket making workshop that Ali held, where we worked with recycled materials to create her jellyfish. So then, finally, recently, Nets moved to Geelong, and that's the private view at the Geelong Grammar School as part of Forum. So it was a very busy event. So I thought I'd show you some shots of Tafta. That's the first time you've managed to see that, Valerie. <laughs> um, so it was an excellent space. It was the first time that you actually see the works together. So it was very much quick decision making in terms of the curation. But it came together within 24 hours, I think it was. Um, but when you actually start to look at the works, you started to see those similarities and the differences. You know, the things that Leslie Miller talked about earlier on, those cultural exchange of ideas. We had people working with very traditional nets and then others taken through to fishing nets using fishing line. Some, some images of, of the forum, our group working. And we did a gallery talk, which was a really useful exercise because it gave us as makers and curators that opportunity to listen and to hear other people talk about their work and to then just to make that, that connection with how people had responded to the project. Quite a good turnout for that. It's a nice photo. Thank you. So I brought some ceramics along, um, ceramics and jewellery. So we opened it up beyond the textile realm. So Jan Goody, whose works in the foreground there, she's a jeweller silversmith, and just started to move into working with, um, to work with porcelain. Just going back to the idea of thinking, that student work from the, the forum, just that idea of actually thinking through the making process and using stitch as a visual language. That was something that really came out um, during the project. Okay, so in terms of my time here, my main point of contact is through the textiles workshop here until December. And my area of research, as I said, is the idea of location-informed practice and how work evolves according to the place where it's made. Um, so I've put to the textiles page and a blog. So that's really a way of actually using that as an archive and as a way of actually disseminating that information. Okay. Um, so following on from Angie, I thought I'd just show a few slides of what we did in Australia. I'll go through them quickly. Um, the project, we were very pleased to engage with our partners, Cumbria and Turku in Finland. It seemed to just really take us out into a world unknown, unexplored, and give us new things to think about and reach out for. 
Um, I really love seeing these pictures because I know these students know that's kind of four years ago. Um, Tara is of this group, the only student still in the school. And I'll just go through these quickly. So we started thinking about all sorts of nets. And it's amazing when you start to think about nets, how much nets are around us. We thought about what they do. We had a weekend workshop and we really brainstormed ideas. And the group in Canberra, I'd say, has really gelled and worked incredibly well together. I'm Sophie Horton, who is a visiting artist. I love this piece of work on the outside of the school because the people in international relations told me they thought it was great because they thought it was all about billums and it related to their area. <laughs> <laughs> so with my first year group at that time, we did lots of um, speculative work. We even re revived Macrami <laughs> in really interesting new and unusual ways. This is Alana. And so there was some lovely speculative work. Crochet, working with unusual materials. Um, <laughs> Jemima's not here at the moment, but this is the point where Jemima changed from straight hair to her dreads as part of the next project. So I always know how long she's had the dreads in her hair by this line with Haley. It was nice for me to meet and see Jemima um, this week, and um, she sees her still there. <laughs> So it, this work provides a real impetus for lots of very experimental, speculative work, lively interpretations of the subject and the theme, um, really interesting things that students did uh, through this project. Finishing. So people took it in all sorts of strange and unexpected directions. Haley, who's now in the sculpture workshop. A large, you can see even from that point she was thinking sculpturally, three dimensional work. This is great, the turtle hat. And sky. Alana. Louisa should be in print media, I think. She moved workshops to print media. Okay, so that's, um, that's just a little run through of what we did with the students, as well as with the next group in Canberra, and Nancy's here from the group, Bev is here from the group today. We've met regularly, we've had weekend workshops, we've come together. And I think that that group has really enabled all the practitioners from the community to extend themselves. It's been a very, very supportive group. And I think it means that the people in that group have been able to just really come together and work critically, reflectively, and embrace the idea of moving their work on with the incentives of the exhibitions, which we've had here in Canberra, in Sydney, and also in Mexico as part of the International Textile Conference. I'll just hand back to Andrew. I think, that, well, I think that's a really important factor that, you know, as a group, that, you know, you start to gel, that you start to have that exchange of ideas. This is a piece, um, an animation from Stella. Um, I showed you the still from it earlier that this was one of the next pieces that she created for our show but I just thought it was quite nice to have if while we were taking any questions because she was weaving the fabric and as well through her MA practice actually starting to work with animation and learning to use animation and edit suites and I can assure you that every single piece of this has been hand stitched and photographed and then, and then filmed by Stella and then put together as a piece of, piece of film. But I think through that you really get to see 
that discipline of making and stitching and the hidden, you know, because it is slow, it's the rhythm of stitch, it's the rhythm of making. And actually seeing it like this as um, removed from the hand is quite interesting. Um, it is, it's just lovely, isn't it? You can just have it as a screensaver or something. It just, it just engages it. I think from from this particular, you know, going back, actually taking, you know, showing the exam, you know, the, the photographs of the exhibition, sending those back to the, the UK, I think we now then need to really look at how we evolve as a group um, in terms of that membership and actually um, just seeing that, you know, what that next stage is getting. And you know, like you say, it's, it's, it's driven by exhibition, isn't it? And I think that's an important factor, that actually having that exhibition venue actually brings that group together. Our, ours are, are not <coughs> as closely knit in that sense that we're not all from within the same city. So, you know, we have people from Scotland right the way down to London. So actually bringing that group together isn't as easy. Um, but what it does mean is that we've had smaller subgroups that have then moved to, to work into doing residences, to doing exhibitions and shows. So it is still a group, but it doesn't necessarily meet as, as often as, as the, the one here does. Um, but there's no reason why we couldn't continue to, to look at that exchange of information and collaboration. So <clears throat> I, I, I saw the, the NETS exhibition that we held here in Australia, mm -hmm. and I, of course, senior students were that there's a response to that, and I didn't sort of gel that that was that response. But what I did gel with was the, the incredible um, uniqueness of that body of work that came out from those students who had been connected with or inspired by that net exhibition. So it was very nice of you to show that second slide and, and, and you know, stitch that connection together for me. Um, and I think that's that's what I've got from this meeting, um, this seminar, is the importance of that international um, flow of ideas and how it, it does have such an incredibly beneficial effect and the students' work, which was just outstanding, I thought, as a result of that next project. I think for us as well, actually, because our group was made up of recent graduates through to more established makers, and actually working within that sort of format, it allows you to actually build up your exhibition profile and actually have that, uh, that exchange of ideas from some more experienced artists. And that then feeds back into the student community. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've seen some amazing way this thing went. I suppose it sort of started with you making the net and thinking this is about their work. You mentioned the process, so I need time to think things through. But, um, and it started initially with just talking to a few friends who were working in things like knitting or or something that I just thought this is about spreading spreading ideas, connecting people, and in Australia probably connecting people are quite isolated and giving them opportunities to think through ideas in a way which will be balanced then against other people um, in an uncritical environment, which is actually what happened. Um, so just, uh, we've, at the end of the Geelong exhibition, we had a, a list of about 15 names, didn't we? People throughout Australia. Who are interested in what's being part of that project? So, we're going to have to now really rethink really about how we're going to do this because we obviously can't keep it Canberra based only. And there can be a centre here, but there are going to be other groups around Australia or people who are doing it through the internet or Yeah, and do we, do we have a touring? Well, we are talking about doing a touring exhibition, which then is 
so So in our, in our first UK show, what we did, because unfortunately our two, ex our two inaugural exhibitions didn't quite um, connect. There was a slight um, time delay, wasn't there? And I think yours was September, ours was October. So, yeah. So we had the virtual, yes. yes. So we've actually shown work virtually through a gallery as well as actually um, inside. So, you know, there's lots of potential there for how it could evolve. I mean, two of the exciting things that have come up recently, one, one is through the Bidham workshop, we've got an invitation to take a tour to go watch the making of the Ancient East in Bywash next year. Mm. And the other thing is in Geelong, um, Eden Roth, Roth, American, amazing textile artist who, who works big <coughs> scale. Um, she's made an amazing net cover of car, which is that we can borrow for an exhibition of advertising, and she wants to be She's mm -hmm. become big, and there's no other reason why next year, when Gabriella takes the assistant architect to Stratton Air, that we can't be coming home and put in the next group to do with um, the environment and, and taking our landscape elements mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think we need to think in terms of perhaps more in installations. Mm -hmm. But those things, you know, we just discuss and work through town meetings. You know, it's, it's it's how how it has evolved. You know, <coughs> something it's a, it's very fluid, but it has some sort of shape as well. And I think that's the that's the interesting aspect of how it does change according to whether it's the space that it's shown in, or whether it's the contributors. They actually affect the the shape of the.